Up until recently, runaway inflation was all anyone could talk about. Suddenly, now everyone is fixating on the surge in bond yields, worried that they'll continue moving even higher. Have we made a permanent shift to an era of higher cost of capital that will constrain economic growth? Or is this spike in yields a transitory one, and those hoping for a Fed pivot and a return to lower interest rates finally get their wish? For answers, we're fortunate to sit down with Danielle DiMartino Booth, CEO and Chief Strategist for Quill Intelligence. She was a former advisor to the Dallas Federal Reserve during the Great Financial Crisis, working with Richard Fisher, and she's author of the book Fed Up. Danielle, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be back with you, Adam. Well, you couldn't have any better timing right now with that question of yours. Great. Well, look, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, even more of a pleasure to talk with you about a timely topic. So let's jump right in. Before we get to bond yields, though, let me just uh, ask you the kickoff question I like to ask you at the beginning of every one of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? So, um, you know, right now, I think the global economy is as close to being in recession as it's been pretty much since 08, 09. Uh, the differentiating factor that I would throw out there is, uh, is that the Federal Reserve is not about to launch zero interest rate policy for the first time. And China is not, an, about, not about to spend enough money to pull the rest of the world out of its global recession. So, you know, I mean, that was one long sentence, but it says a lot. Yeah, our, our, our two difference. normal saviors are not coming to the rescue. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that is the differentiating factor between then and now. They're completely separate from one another. But boy, do they get related when aggregated. All right. Um, well, look, uh, so we have this interesting moment in time here where I've, I've asked this question of a few folks recently. I'm, I'm dying to hear your answer. Um, so first off, you said we're basically on the precipice of recession, right? Which is interesting because you read the headlines and of course they dialed hard landing down to soft landing now to no landing at all, right? So it's certainly not a recession the markets are pricing in uh, at this point. But we've had on the monetary side, Jerome Powell and the Fed jamming the brakes, right? With this historically aggressive uh, rate hiking campaign while QT is going on. You have the banking system concurrently placing its foot on top of the Fed's foot on the brake, pushing down because they're tightening lending standards, um, mostly because they just want to protect themselves from, from bad loans, right? So that is pushing hard on the brakes. Yet over on the fiscal side, right, we're running one of the highest deficits we've ever run. Certainly on a, as a percent of GDP, it's one of the most aggressive you know, we've ever had. We've never had one this aggressive from that standpoint with unemployment this low. Um, so we have this very weird mismatch where the Fed, that we've got the monetary brakes being pumped while simultaneously we're jamming on the economic gas. What dynamic is this creating and how long can you do that before you start really having some, some big issues that, that are undesirable, like a resurgence of inflation from, from the fiscal stimulus? So I, I think that... Um... I think that there are, as you say, several dynamics. What what you didn't mention is that it, this is all dot, dot, dot in peacetime. So uh, right. you know, historically- it, we've I'm glad you said that, sorry to jump in, but I've said many times, in fact, in the intro to my last video, we have a wartime deficit in a peacetime economy. Exactly, exactly. And, and what's interesting is when you're running wartime deficits, all companies are lining up to do what they can to do their share for Uncle Sam, because it's the patriotic and the right thing to do. Because the Biden administration has, has kind of handcuffed a lot of the initiatives that have come out with the Inflation Reduction Act, with e ESG and DEI initiatives, say what you will, but there are several well-known companies that have been burned recently by trying to cross the line into being political rather than to just serve their shareholders. So you're not going to have the same uptake as you would otherwise. Uh, but what we are seeing currently in the here and now is the vestiges of the infrastructure spending. And when you look at non-building 
And that's actually a term. It means it means construction activity that doesn't actually create a structure, create a, a building that goes up, create a home that you that you that you're living in. But when you tangle that out of the Dodge construction data on a monthly basis, you're seeing that non-residential construction and residential construction are down year over year, but that's being almost fully offset by infrastructure type of spending. So that's a 12 to 18 month lag. And that's why we're seeing more stability than we would otherwise right now in the US economy. The reason I bring this up, Adam, is because there will be a lagged effect to the Inflation Reduction Act spending, which is the next big level of fiscal stimulus. We hear about it, the government is spending it, but we're not seeing it manifest yet in the US economy. But again, the recipients are not necessarily as you would have seen in wartime across the board. Some companies are some companies are going to stop back and say, step back and say, you know what, I don't want this funding. I don't want the the I don't want what's attached to it because I'm I, I live in fear of my shareholders revolting and or worse, the people who buy my products. So again, this is this is this is a transmission mechanism type of situation that I think people have to distinguish. When we were pumping wartime spending levels, when we were pumping $7.6 trillion into the economy on a trailing 12 month basis, as opposed to what we're doing right now, 6.7 trillion, I'm citing Michael Hartnett at Bank of, Bank of America data, that first huge push into the economy was bypassing the banking system and going directly into households checking accounts. That ignited real inflation. What we're seeing today, though, it's going to go through companies and eventually to the end consumer, many of whom are going to be unionized employees. And it's not going to have the same immediate and direct and, as I would say, efficient impact if you're talking about fiscal policy transmitting to inflation. And that's why I follow this gauge called Truflation. Uh, the people who who run the, the the gauge, they were kind enough to give me the data back to 2012 uh, when it first came out. If you look at, at, at the correlation, since it was introduced January of 2012, it has a 97% correlation with headline CPI. Well, guess what? It's ticked up quite a bit from about 2.1 to about 2.7 in very short order. But if you look inside the components of Truflation, that really is a gasoline prices at the pump situation. Whereas food prices are actually declining, of course, food prices are twice your input that energy are into the CPI. And shelter is declining as well. That's mainly an apartment story. And you're starting to see more and more references to apartments oversupply. We're starting to come to that recognition phase. Before it was just like, well, we've got a million units in the pipeline and it was nice and theoretical to talk about. Now they're actually completed and the units are opening and competing with existing multifamily units. So we are seeing that actual deflation come down the pipeline. Of course, that's 40% of your CPI. So I would argue that the fiscal stimulus is indeed something that has taken a lot of attention of investors, but by the same token, it will not act as immediately as what we saw with the pandemic crisis uh, response as we see. And I, I posit that while we'll have some base effects going into the fall in the inflation numbers, that the areas that are that are seeing disinflation and actual outright deflation apartment rents are going to be stronger. They're gonna be a stronger drag on that, especially as we see the labor force continue to deteriorate, which is not a figment of my imagination, Adam.